Why does the Terminator, the T-800, look and sound like Arnold Schwarzenegger? <laughs> Hi, I'm Chief Master Sergeant William Candy. I was honored to be selected by CRS in the ongoing effort to save American lives. I don't know about that accent. We can fix it. No, no. Okay, hold, <laughs> hold on. That's a just... whole. That's a whole can of worms that just you just what, opened up there. Can I? Is he? Wait, was he being dubbed over? <laughs> yes, the internet is convinced. Because he is, he is incapable as far as I'm yes. of not having his real accent. As far as I'm aware. I was gonna say if that was really him, then that's his voice. Like, why, why is, is he, he not... doing this all the time? That's what I was just gonna say. It's like if you were, if he can do different accents, like do a different accent. That's why I'm like, <laughs> that's why I fucking like jingle all the way. Everyone has to just accept that Arnold Schwarzenegger sounds Austrian because he can't do anything yeah, else. Yeah, yeah. Put that cookie down. No! Um, that was <laughs> absurd. So somebody dubbed Arnold in like a really bad, like weird the, foghorn the internet, leghorn thing. The internet is convinced. Nobody knows who did it. The internet is convinced that is the voice of Samuel L. Jackson. No. It did sound like a black guy. Yeah, it I was. Kind of, I'm. I'm just so confused. I thought it was like, did they get like Carl Weathers to like you know, his old <laughs> his old predator pal yeah, that to was come pretty in? Good. <laughs> that movie was already a piece of shit. <laughs> so to like, take this out, I couldn't even imagine. <laughs> Making stuff is hard, especially in the entertainment world when there are millions of dollars on the line. We're gonna talk about these disastrous, never-ending, and sometimes downright dangerous productions. This is The Shit Show. Hello, friends. Hello, Ray. Hello. Hello, Clint. Hello. Hello to myself. What What's happening right now? <laughs> sorry, 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 everybody. Sorry for the dry spell. Uh, you have to re- reintroduce you to everybody. Oh, geez, yeah, we're a little rusty, I guess. Um, He's just energized that we're all back together. That's true. It's that's been it too long. Yeah. Uh, we rescheduled like twice, and then someone here had to go and get COVID. Oh, oh don't tell the fans. And then give it gave it to me. Um, I, I breathed directly into his mouth um, many times just to make sure he got it. You will suffer with me. Yes. I'm clean. <laughs> Have you seen there's like all those like memes out there or there are gifts that you see of people like if you survived 2020 or 2020 without getting COVID and one of them is Mario jumping around all those different like. Yeah, the fireball the fireballs and Mario makes like that's like, exactly how I feel. Yeah, yeah. no, I mean it, it almost. <sighs> made know. it. We made it over a year, over the two year gap. Yeah, or the two years. I know there. it's so frustrating, but also based on my record of playing Mario, I'm not surprised that I was the one who got it because I'm real bad at dodging those fireballs. <laughs> hey, so you just made when it you get years, it in your head, did you go? That <laughs> <laughs> came up like yeah. Resident Evil. You died. You died. <laughs> Damn it. Uh, okay, so today's episode is going to be a random one. Um, inspired by one of the dumbest recent news stories. Uh, well, was recent when I wrote this. And then we <laughs> delayed it for like two months. Recent-ish. <laughs> yeah. Kind of um, recent. Two men from San Diego who rented the film yesterday for $3.99 are suing Universal Pictures for $5 million dollars. Because the trailers included Ana de Armas, Mm -hmm. who is not in the final film. (laughs) That's absolutely ludicrous. These idiots claim they would have never rented the film knowing that fact. Um, Okay, even so. Get a refund. (laughs) Like, you spent $4? Calm the fuck down. Yes. And listen, this has nothing to, nothing, it's not anything to do with Ana de Armas. She's great. Oh, she's quite lovely. But that shit happens all the time. <gasps> yeah, I. So wait, Ana de Armas was in the trailer. In the trailer for yesterday. Uh-huh. But then, for whatever reason, her scene was cut. Correct. So these jabronis <laughs> went to a red box, rented yesterday 
think it was like an Amazon or something. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do they do that? Does Amazon like their? They yeah, like, you can rent. Like physical copies or? Oh, it's not no, physical. Like oh, I keep, I, I'm still like the blockbuster. Yeah, you're, like, you're, where the, they, <laughs> they went to Hollywood well, video. Quick, get out of 2001, <laughs> okay, <laughs> my dude. <laughs> so they they rent it on Amazon. Uh, she's not in it, mm-hmm. and they're like, "Huh." Well, yeah. let's let's sue him. Like, yeah, for five million for what? Pain and suffering. God, jeez. I mean, I love her as much as the next guy. But look, and yesterday was a fun <laughs> movie, but to like <laughs> to to cry and bitch and moan about like, yeah that for okay. I mean, more power yeah. to you. It's America. Sue whoever you want for however much you want. <laughs> but are you serious? Yeah. So yeah. you will be laughed out of court. Yes. <laughs> so what what was their like reasoning? What was the actual like court filing? Was it like five know. million dollars for psychological in, damage in like selling a false product or some shit like that? Like not they representing were... <laughs> your product correctly to consumers. They were on track to be the world to have the world's the Guinness Book of World Record for seeing every on a day Armas movie. And this just completely threw off their schedule. And so now they're like, they're out $5 million because of their Did schedule. they like lose a $5 million bet? They're like, I bet you $5 million on a day Armas is in this movie. <laughs> yeah. And like, then they're like, fuck. fuck. Yeah. And, 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 and they're two fuck. completely, they're not even friends. I don't know how the, these two idiots found each other. On really? some Reddit thread? Yeah. Some slash but they're both asshole. In, they're Reddit both in the thread. same town? Yes. So it was, you said it was San Diego. Yes. So was it like a subreddit of San Diego fans against yeah, right. against <laughs> Amazon <laughs> or some shit like that? It as was far, the San yeah. Diego bran- uh, uh, branch of the Ana de Armas fan club. They they are claiming false, deceptive, and misleading advertising. Ah, okay. There you go. Could they also then sue Sony for not including that scene in Morbius where he's walking in front of the Spider-Man mural? <laughs> yeah, or, or all these other films that we're going to talk about today. Yeah, so, this is like so par for the course with how Hollywood does things. I, I know. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to start a series about editing and how uh, a few scenes here and, here and there can truly alter a film. And in the future, we'll discuss like alternate endings or mm. deleted scenes that fundamentally just change a film. But let's start off easy. Today, let's talk other famous actors who were cut from big films. So to clarify, uh, we are not going to talk about recasting, which we covered in our episode, Replaced Actors. So like Eric Stoltz in Back to the Future or Tobey Maguire and Pie. This is not this case. These are times when an actor filmed their entire part for the film, but when the director got to the editing room, they decided their scene was not needed for whatever reason. Mm, okay. Um, I'm going to try to keep these in the vein of a shit show um, or films we previously discussed. All right, let's do it. Okay, so starting with Yesterday... Um, actually has its own shit show beginnings. Um, TV writer Jack Barth, uh, he's done so many random different things, but probably his most known work is he wrote the Simpsons episode, A Fish Called Selma, the one where Troy McClure marries uh, Selma. Oh, that's a um, that's an excellent Simpsons yeah, episode. Good one. Um but that's the only one he did. Um and really? then he spent out of like out of like the thousands of episodes of the Simpsons he only wrote the one? Mhm. Interesting. And, uh and but he's just written for all kinds of different TV. A lot a lot of like um variety specials, stuff like that. Oh, okay. He spent 40 years trying to sell 25 different scripts that he had written. So this is kind of this is kind of the polar opposite of what happened with Diane Thomas in uh, Romancing the Stone. Remember she wrote her one. first yeah. script ever yeah. was this huge thing, right? So she won the lottery and he's completely losing it. Yeah. <laughs> right? That um, sucks. 25 scripts? 25 different scripts. Damn. He sold his first script in 2012 at the age of 62. Whoa. Good for him. That's actually... <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, Hollywood sucks. Perseverance. Just, That's what yeah. it teaches you. Yeah. Like a Dude, bit, I, yeah. I would have given up like so so fast. I've just been like, it's never going to happen for me. I mean, I've guys. given up before I even started. Yeah. <laughs> no. It's not going to work. Pretty it's not much work. like getting anything made is a, is a miracle in Hollywood. Yes. yes. Uh, so yeah, that it was kind of a big story when it happened, um, when he sold the script, cause it was like the opposite Cinderella story from yeah. Diane Thomas. <laughs> right. Um, it was kind of a, a story that was written about how a man finally sold his screenplay at over age 60 when they tell you like, don't even enter the industry at past right. 40. Right, um, right. 
But like he had been a working actor, yes. uh, working right. writer. Yes. So it wasn't true. like he just randomly entered the yeah. industry. He at wasn't. 16. Yeah, he wasn't it was like just a... that he hadn't had his like break. Yeah, exactly. Um, but his first script, and it was called Cover Version, about a singer songwriter who magically becomes the only person to remember the Beatles. Who wants to be the writer? The the grandpa, the grandpa who sold the screenplay. Mm-hmm. Screenplay grandpa. <laughs> okay, screenplay grandpa. <laughs> That's a screenplay I'm gonna write mm. and sell. Um, this is Jack Barth on how he came up with the idea of cover version. I wrote it from my point of view, which was I was lying in bed one night thinking, if Star Wars hadn't been made and I just came up with the idea for Star Wars. I bet I wouldn't be able to sell it. Carry that on to the Beatles. If I knew all the Beatles songs, I bet I couldn't be successful with it. Oh, man, this poor guy. <laughs> this is like his life ethos. He's even if I wrote fucking Star Wars, no one would have bought it. No one would have bought it until I was 75. Yeah. Fuck you, Hollywood. It would be posthumous. They'd find like this manuscript in my drawer after yeah. I'm dead and like, oh, what's this? Let's make this. Yeah. I wouldn't even get to, to bask in it. <laughs> I'm basically the Van Gogh of screenwriting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to wait until I'm dead yeah. before it's popular. Um, keep that actually that mindset in mind because I think this really uh, uh, explains a lot of the emotions that go on during this story. Um, okay. So working title, ironically, the company working title, mm. uh, buys cover version uh, five years. terrible ago. title, by the way. Cover version. <laughs> Sorry. Cover, yeah. Uh, so he's uh, – they buy it and five years go by. Then Richard Curtis of Love Actually, Bridget Jones, mm. um, very famous writer-director, decides this will be his next film. Barth assumes that Curtis wants to just produce it. Uh, but during the final signing of the documents, he says Curtis um, sees on the line there, it says Curtis will be the sole screenwriter and Barth would only get co-story credit. Oh, so, just let this man have his fucking screenwriting credit. This is the Lone Ranger guy all over again. This is like, just damn. give it to the old man. You know yes. what? I'm on. I'm on team screenplay, Grandpa. This guy is. Yes. Yeah. Hundred percent. This. Yeah. He's the hero of this yeah. story. So Barth is just sick of this song and dance because it's been five years. Right. And he's just whatever signs plus 60 65 years <laughs> yeah now yeah. he's 67 67 yeah. 67 there you go. um so he's just sick of it he just signs um barth's original script was about the singer only becoming slightly more famous than before mm. so the idea that the beatles weren't just their lyrics it was their musical talent their inventiveness their style and quintessentially perfect timing being in that exact moment in time in the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really kind of uh, a story about the message versus the messenger, right? Mm -hmm. That's the the idea of this, the whole um, screenplay. Now, if you've seen Yesterday, Curtis's version is obviously more of a straightforward rom-com about the guy becoming uber famous. But the, the story in it is that he still wants his small town girl. Uh... Barth assumes that the reason Curtis changed the entire message of the film is because Curtis has been successful for his entire career versus uh, he hasn't known failure like Barth. Yeah. Right. No one knows failure like Barth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like it's like it's like taking one idea <laughs> from a pessimist versus an optimist or right. I guess right. <laughs> like a successful person versus a burned out person. So. Yes, what you were saying. Right. Like yeah, he, like he's like, well, with the right ideas, you just got to work hard and you can make it happen. And this guy's like, I've been doing that my whole goddamn life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's not possible. I've got gumption coming out of my ass <laughs> yeah. for 62 years. You want to talk about vim and vigor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but so this is where it starts getting a little darker, though. Um, throughout the promotions, Richard Curtis kept saying – that he was only told, he only heard the one sentence idea. A uh, singer becomes the only person to remember the Beatles. Mm. Um, he kept hearing that one sentence and wrote the entire film by himself. So none of the uh, rest of it is is all just original to him. To, to Curtis? To Curtis. Ugh. Yet both scripts have the singer 
visiting a still alive John Lennon, now a fisherman, and both end with the joke that Harry Potter also doesn't exist. Hmm. So very like particular detail to right. suddenly like, oh, we had the same idea. Like, mm, highly doubtful. Yeah. I mean, maybe if one of them was like John Lennon's still alive, but instead he's like a pugilist or something. <laughs> just right. Di- just yeah. like slightly. Yeah. I mean, it could he could have been George Harrison. It could have been all of them. Yeah. Or, I, I, Are there any? <laughs> Ringo's I mean, a train conductor. <laughs> yeah. Are there any other similarities? Like, do... yeah, like it's it's but basically it's the same broad strokes, but because his is more about becoming famous, his is kind of like it, I think it, it kind starts of very off. yeah it, it starts off in the same kind of right um, way, and then it kind of goes different. Well, but, that's highly suspicious. Yes. <laughs> have you have you seen the movie? Have you seen it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I'm just curious. Right? Yeah. I was just curious I mean, like what the other similarities are because yeah. that 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 to me is something that you get litigious over. It, which he did. Yeah. I mean, um, I, I liked it, but now I'm kind of mad that I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, according to Richard Curtis, he got the Harry Potter joke from Sarah Silverman. Again, he's kind of deflecting. Right. Um, but Barth did sue. Um, I don't know what happened with this. The, I think it's too early to tell. But this is what um, Barth had to say um, about this whole situation. By the time I realized I needed to get the story out there myself, it was really hard to pitch something that was for a film that had come out eight months earlier. Most of the media is concerned with just promoting the current films. They're not interested in a story about the abuse of the powerless by the powerful. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. So he got fucked over. Oh, um, he got barthed. <laughs> yeah. Poor and, Barth. And he says the whole ordeal hasn't helped his career in any way. So Aww. even though even though he was like had this huge like story about being this old guy that sold a screenplay, yeah. did he, he at least get, get like, other jobs? Did and... he at least get paid for the screenplay? Well, originally, Sorry? yes. Yeah. Now homeboy is seventy two. <laughs> yeah, and uh, damn, just sad. Is the is the that court case still in progress? Yeah, I, mean, I think so. Okay, there's so just not been a resolution yet. Yeah, right. Fucking all courts, right. Man. Um, we'll forever. keep you all. We'll keep you all updated <laughs> on yeah. the progress <laughs> of the Barth case. It's called Barth, Barth this Watch. This is now. <laughs> this is now a fucking true crime podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> true, true Hollywood crime. True Hollywood Release crime. Release the Barth cut. Yeah, Barth Watch. <laughs> Barth, Barth Watch 2022. <laughs> Now let's talk about the actual movie. <laughs> um, in the movie, in the original version, um, the original cut, uh, Ana de Armas plays an actress, Roxanne, who also is appearing on James Corden's show when Jack is on. So there's a bit of that in the movie, but it looks like it's just Jack, the mm. main character, mm. right. on the couch with James Corden. And the point of the scene is to drive home that Jack is now in the sights of film star beauties. Jack, I'm such a fan. It's great to meet you. Thank you for being here. Um, have your paths crossed before? Do you know Roxanne? No, no, no we've never no. met before, but, but it's really nice to meet you. I'm a big fan. Nice meeting you. Me too. Wow. Thank, yeah. Thanks. Wait a minute. Did I see a blush there? Was there, <laughs> was know, there, was there blushing? There. It no, felt like there was blushing. It was just delight, giving him a sort of blushy look. Um, so, so that was the only scene she was in? Yes, that's it. Oh, I okay. mean, well, it was I mean... a good scene. They probably deserve that $5 million. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Basically, like, it seems like that that whole scene is probably just a vehicle for, like, conflict, like romantic yes. interest conflict. But, yeah. um, so Danny Boyle hasn't commented on any of this, but considering Roxanne isn't anywhere else in the movie, uh, the idea of Jack and Ellie being separated via fame is already hit pretty hard throughout the entire movie. Right. Yeah. So it, I don't think... The scene was necessary. And right. so that was probably, once they got to the editing room, it was like, this. we'll just put it in that montage moment where they just have him playing the song on James Corden. Right. Shit so, like that happens all the time. That's exactly. completely normal. So that is a completely is, normal thing to happen. That is what we're talking about <laughs> yeah. today. Like People realize, I'm just going back to those two idiots from San Diego. Like You realize <laughs> that like if they left everything into every movie... Like no one would watch movies because they'd be for fucking. It'd be the ever goddamn long. Snyder cut, is what it would be. You guys. And it wouldn't necessarily I mean, masterpieces. And it wouldn't necessarily make it good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. I, yeah. I'm so sick and tired of Snyder cut shit. Okay, <laughs> we're gonna get to that. Oh, later. okay. Yeah. No. Um. Okay. So, uh, worth it? <laughs> Was it worth cutting the scene? Was the film worth it? 
I'm gonna say no now that I've I've all the I love Danny Boyle. I had no idea he even directed it until we watched it, and then I was like, directed by Danny Boyle? What the fuck? I would say it's one of his worst movies. I mean, I mean, because Danny Boyle, the rest of his stuff is so great. Yeah, I would put it at the bottom of his list. Um, it's but a, it's a perfectly it's fine. fine movie. It's I, fine. I liked it. But now, but now with Jack Barth's story behind it, was it worth it? I mean, that sucks for Barth, but like you have to consider, uh, you know, the other people who made this movie. Like that's <laughs> yes. probably a big deal for the guy who played Jack, right? Oh yeah, it was. Uh, he's in in the credits. It's introduced like as his first film. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I mean, and I then would he shows say, up in Tenet. So yeah, like like he's a talented actor. So I, uh, it's it's so hard because you have like there's so many people who are involved in making a movie mm-hmm. that it's just like. Like yeah, like maybe one like one person probably got screwed over. It was a, it was obviously like a big deal for the Jack, the actor who played Jack, and like it kind of launched his career. So that's great for him. And like it's a it's a like nice movie. Like yeah, it's, it's a fine. sweet yeah. movie. Yeah, like it's, it's fine. It's and cute. so I would say I, sure. I yeah. must say though I, that the end of that movie, I hate the ending of that movie where he goes up on stage and then he goes the real. These were songs written by the Beatles, and then he says the, their four names, and then like the audience is like, the, the, I mean, <laughs> and the whole world would be like, who the fuck are they talking? Who's he talking about? And then they would go find John Lennon and Paul McCartney. Yeah, you wrote these songs? No. What are you talking about? <laughs> what are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> so it just made the the ending of the movie just be like, okay, this is gonna spiral out of control. Right? I'm just right. a fisherman. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I'm going to say it was worth it pending Barth gets a great settlement. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's a good one. Yeah. Wait, it's too early to say. Too early to say. Uh, no, Barth, Barth, Barth Watch? Barth Watch 2022. Barth watch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next one. Road to Perdition. Um, based on the graphic novel, the film takes place during the Great Depression and Prohibition and follows one man's war against the mob, played by Tom Hanks. Um, even though the characters are all fiction, it's clear throughout the movie that Al Capone is the head honcho. Um, and they filmed one scene with Anthony LaPaglia as Capone. Hmm. Um, you, you guys know who Anthony LaPaglia is? I mean, I, I've heard the name, but I don't know if I would be able to pick him from a lineup. Yeah, you you would you would recognize him. LaPaglia, what's funny about LaPaglia, I love this kind of thing. He is the son of a Dutch mother, Italian father. He was born and raised in Australia. Mm-hmm. And what is he mostly known for? Playing Italian Americans. <laughs> right. It's, yeah. Hollywood kind of does that. They pick up on any ethnic yeah. vagueness you have, and they're just like, yeah, and you're a pigeonhole. <laughs> His best role ever. So I married an axe murderer. He's the his cop friend. Oh my god, yes. Yes. Okay. okay. That, yes. Him. Thank you. <laughs> Finally, yes. you're on That's, my level. Yes. You're speaking my language. Yes. That. Um great uh character. One great of the greatest character. characters, I think. Uh so he plays Al Capone in one scene, and that's it. Um, and then director Sam Mendez cut the scene because he felt that having Capone unseen kept him as a like a mythical unseen force. Like Jaws. Right. Yeah, that makes yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well Josh like, shows up. Like the, <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, right. the myth is is more terrifying than yes. the man. Yeah, like yeah. just the threat of him possibly being there right. and, or showing up, all hell could break loose. Yeah, even Got though it. we saw Sauron in the beginning of the Fellowship of the Rings, like him just being like this omniscient eye, like not actually having a corporeal form. Yeah, I mean was mm-hmm. terrifying. I mean in theory, like that whole the whole series is him coming back, right? Yeah. Is What's terrifying? Yeah, that's a perfect example of what we're talking about today. It's actually this this example is what I was thinking about, like a famous actor getting bumped for doing like a really cool role, yeah. right? And um, it's probably like super disappointing for him, but there's also fe- it feels like there's legitimate reasons from a story perspective. Yeah, that they're like, yeah, it's fine. It doesn't it doesn't really make yeah. sense in the scene? And you guys can you can you can all Google it and find it. It's pretty easy to find. Um, he gets to be the this powerful guy who's making the three other actors in the room uh, terrified. Jude Law, Stanley Tucci, and Paul Newman. Like, Damn. he gets to be, like, the badass in yeah. that room. Yeah. <laughs> wow, there you go. But, I mean, like, he still gets paid, right? Yes, he gets paid. Oh, yes. yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, what is is that worse? Like, is it, I guess I should ask that. Is it worth it for an actor? I mean, I don't know. We can, I mean, I can ask you, too. Maybe you would have a better opinion. To do a role 
get paid for it, but then be like, oh, I'm not going to be seen. Like, wouldn't you want that exposure? Be like, oh yeah, I was in this movie as this character. Or are you like, nah, I still got paid for it. Like, yeah, what's... it's kind of a double edged sword because one, um, I, there's an example that's lost from my mind, but um, someone, someone that does something like that and does not even raise a fuss, like that person. All three of those actors in that room saw, and even the director, like, remember him, right? They were like, damn, that guy knocked it out of the park. Mm -hmm. Like, he was great. He was great on set, if he was, right? And then they remember him going forward for what, whatever projects, right? So yeah. that they could recommend him. Right. Versus if you get cut and then you raise a fucking fuss about it, and then you're like, oh, he's difficult. Uh, right. Yeah. Well, I think it depends on what point you are in your career and and the size of the role. So, like, if you just did like a like a bit player kind of part, and you got cut, and you still got paid for the day, you might be like, oh, that's a super bummer. But like, whatever, it was a bit part anyway, and I got paid for the day. So, like, on to bigger and better things. But like, if it was a role that you were just like, I am so excited about this role. This could be like career launching. Like, yeah. this could be like, I like. <laughs> You know, and I don't like I don't know how La Paglia felt about this role, but I could see it being like, well, yeah, I got paid, but I was really excited about this character. And this mm -hmm. would have been like good exposure for me. And it could have, you know, it could have elevated my like status as an actor because that's a like Road to Perdition is like a big movie. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Big so, Tom Hanks movie. Yeah. yeah. And this is all very top of mind for me because I've been listening to Dead Eyes and the whole <laughs> podcast is about this is about like. Actors mm. dealing with like disappointment and how they feel about it, and like getting roles and not getting roles and getting cut from roles, and like Tom Hanks and Tom Hanks, and, <laughs> and so like I just I think it depends on like the role, where you are in your career, and sort of like what your priority is, right? Mm. Because you might get paid, you know, if you're just going to go out to a film and do like a day, you might get paid like five hundred dollars for the day. That's kind of nothing compared to being like I had an on-screen role in like this mm -hmm. movie yeah. and having like the resume ad, being able to put that on your resume and say that like yes, I was in this thing, I didn't get cut or I yeah. whatever, you know. Yeah. Check out Road to Perdition if you've never seen it. One of my favorite films ever, won best cinematography mm -hmm. because it's fucking gorgeous. Love it. Okay, next one. Uh movie we've discussed before. Iron Man. Uh, the first episode of Shit Show was about the creation of the MCU and how the first An Iron Man movie was kind of made up as they went along. Uh, a pivotal moment in the final film is when Tony's watching the news and he sees some the same terrorists who kidnapped him ransacking a Middle Eastern town. He gets angry, uses the Iron Man suit to fly there, and has his iconic tank moment, all that, right? Right. Uh, in the original cut, Tony sets up an elaborate, like, Bruce Wayne-style a plan to like conceal himself by having Pepper set up a party for him in Dubai. So he sees the news story and he's like, I need to have a reason to go over there. Yeah. And so he's like, Pepper, we should have a party in Dubai. They fly there via private jet. He attends the party where they'll have fireworks, then takes three women up to his room for some fun, <laughs> then uses the fireworks as cover to fly away in the Iron Man suit. Mm, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's a hat on a hat. It's like a lot. It's a lot yeah. of like too much. It's it's a lot of story to get to the goal. Yes. Uh, during his this party, he chats with rapper Ghostface Killer, who plays himself. In real life, Ghostface Killer is actually a big Iron Man fan, and his oh. debut album is called Iron Man. And one of his aliases is Tony Stark's. Uh, in the scene, he offers up two women for Tony. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, stop. Hey. How are you? Nice to see you. I'm sorry, I still got your plane. Oh, no, 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 and I got Some your Bentley, so just bring it back full of gas and uh, everything's... Yes. Hi. Are they... That's for you. For this my consideration? For this is for you. Good I'm evening. Sorry. I'm thinking of a number between one and five. Three. Exactly. This was obviously cut for many reasons. It ruins the pace, makes Tony seem like even a man, even more of a man whore than he he kind yeah. of was alluded to in the in the original cut. I just feel bad for Pepper. Yeah, she's it's like, so oh, like, like I have rolling to. Her eyes. Yeah, she's like, I made this whole party so you can go have sex. There's like, easier ways to do that, Tony. You <laughs> yeah. simply just go downtown or whatever. Yeah, or you're gonna just go to any other just go to any other party in <laughs> yes. New York City. And just and be like, hey. And so right. it sets up an extremely sexual situation for a PG-13 film. Right. For no reason. No and reason. No payoff. And then the cover story doesn't matter. 
And then having the suit available to fly anywhere around the world is a better choice for the character. Right. Plus, all audiences fully just accept it. Like, right. when he just sees it on the news, he jumps in his suit and flies there. Yeah. Like, how much faster is he that? He doesn't yeah. need a reason. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't need a reason to be <laughs> yeah. in Dubai. He could go f- fast, if not f- as fast, if not faster than, like, a real, like, super jet. <laughs> Right. Like he's he's he could get there in no time. The, the time it took him to set up, get Pepper to set up a party in Dubai, like and get people to show up. And yeah, those <laughs> yeah. terrorists have like fucked up. They're not in that town anymore. Yeah. All like, of those... What is this? It's like been two months, and he's gonna yeah. go exactly. All of those his innocent revenge. people are dead. Yeah. 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 Right? Yes. Yeah. So... Okay, but let me guess where this is going. Ghostface Killer was very upset about being cut. Nope, he was fine with it. Oh, he was okay. just like he thought he uh, he has a song on the soundtrack. So yeah. <laughs> So that like, was his contribution. <laughs> he's probably like, I'm still going to be like in the DVD deleted scenes, right? Oh yeah, sure. Like, no, okay, right, <laughs> yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, so now, fast forward to the, all the way to the end to Avengers Endgame. Uh, remember when Thanos snaps his fingers in in Infinity War, mm-hmm. and he goes inside the Soul World, and he sees a young Gamora, who says, "Was it worth it? What right. did it cost?" Mm-hmm. And he's like, everything. And that's pretty much the end of the movie, right? Right. In the original version of Endgame, which if I keep going through my MCU videos, I might just do one on Endgame because that whole movie was kind of like made up as they went along. It's just like Iron Man. Damn. Which is crazy considering it's, it's <laughs> how good it is. It's really good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah um, oh, those they, Russo brothers. Yeah. They didn't do like the, s- the script page like grab bag. <laughs> yeah. the, the, was, the money take. The money yeah. take. <laughs> Yeah. No, it's like like just a short story. Like Brie Larson shot her role as Captain Marvel on Endgame before she even shot Captain Marvel. Interesting. But Captain Marvel came out before. So like okay. just stuff like that where they just constantly were just like, okay, and they were just piecemealing it and they they built it and then they broke it down and then they built it again. Like just kept yeah. doing that, which yeah. is actually like – how the creative process works, they're just allowed billions of dollars to do that. Jeez, man. So in this original version of Endgame, when Tony snaps the gauntlet at the end, mm-hmm. he goes to the soul world and meets a, his grown-up daughter, Morgan, Aww. played by Catherine Langford from 13 Reasons Why and Knives Out. Um, and then, hmm. then they have this kind of moment where he, she tells him that he's going to die after this. Um, but that the sacrifice is worth it, and then she grows up happy. This is cut because this is obviously way too confusing, <laughs> like, and way too much at the end of that movie to be like, who is this person? Right. Why? Okay, but we just got used to knowing the kid Morgan. Now we're meeting a different version of Morgan. Like it was just like too much. Mm. Yeah. Well, and the and like I feel like it actually kind of lessens the emotional impact of like the I love you three thousand and how like just absolutely traumatic yeah. Yeah. his death is with Pepper and like that he he finally got to a point where he was like had this this other life. Yeah. It has more of an emotional impact without that scene. I yeah. think it makes sense. Yeah, because everything after that still works. Yeah. Right. You didn't need it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Here's a weird one. Ghostbusters two. Mm-hmm. Um directed by Ivan Reitman. Peace be upon him. Uh so in my video about Ghostbusters, I mentioned that Ivan Reitman replaced the entire last 25 minutes of the film in what he calls a moment of exquisite focus. The movie just died a horrible death. We went out and shot 25 minutes in four days to replace everything that happened from that moment on. Four days to replace Jeez. like a third a, a or a quarter of your, of your movie. movie. Wow. <laughs> I love that. A moment of exquisite focus. <laughs> I one day hope to achieve that in my lifetime. Right? Just that word exquisite. Mm. Like, mm, it's delicious sounding. Well, because if you put that in front of any other like feeling, mm-hmm. it just intensifies. Like, oh, I was in exquisite pain. I'm like, shit, that dude was in some serious pain. Right? But like, also like he enjoyed it kind yeah. of maybe. Ex- yeah. Exquisite focus. Like Man, he's got a boner the whole time. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm so focused right now. <laughs> if your exquisite focus lasts more than four hours, consult your physician. Four days. <laughs> so, um, in the final film, the Ghostbusters get locked up in a psych- psychiatric ward by the mayor's villainous assistant. 
uh, once the mayor finds out about this, he fires the assistant and gets the Ghostbusters out in time to save the day. Saving the day. Oh my, that was... <laughs> That was the nerdiest thing that's possibly ever <laughs> happened on this podcast. And this is a really Save nerdy podcast. We get it. I'm really, yeah, glad, we, I, we, I'm yeah. really glad I was here to experience We're this. in sync, bro. <laughs> now, does your exquisite focus <laughs> yeah. lasting too long? Yeah, basically. <laughs> um, now, originally what happens is Eugene Levy actually gets the Ghostbusters out. He plays Guesses. Very common 80s thing to do with for a sequel. Um, a brother? Yeah, a relationship, yeah, like a, a family member of who? To either Spangler or Lewis. Dead on. Lewis Tully's cousin. Ah. Okay. Sherman Tully. Fuck, <laughs> man. The dermatologist at the hospital. Come on, Sherm. You gotta do this for me. I'm begging you. You're my cousin. Are you out of your gourd? I can lose my job, Lewis. I can't do it. I can. That's unethical. I, I don't want to lose my license. Well, can't you just release him? You're a doctor. I'm a dermatologist. I can't write orders on a psych ward. Crazy people have skin problems too. You <laughs> I guys. was just gonna say, like, do they? Is that like common things? Like, hey, we have a psych- psychiatric ward in our resident. Derm- yeah, me. Resident, <laughs> dermatologist. resident dermatologist. I would imagine there would just be like one on call from like a, yeah. another hospital. Like, yeah. Oh yeah. We usually just use you know Doctor Tully, and he's stationed down at you know yeah, Mount right. Sinai or whatever. <laughs> we call him when there's a particularly bad eczema flare up. In the... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. As a favor to Lewis, <laughs> they get all, they all get rashes from their straight jackets. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 Probably, probably true. It's probably real. Um, as a favor to Lewis, Sherman breaks the Ghostbusters out, and Lewis tells them that he offered Sherman a ride in the Ecto-1 as a reward for breaking them out. Interesting. <laughs> and the Ghostbusters speed away, and Sherman is confused as to why Lewis isn't with them, alluding to the fact that Lewis has been telling his family that he 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 himself oh, has been a Ghostbuster. Obviously, this is cut because like 20 minutes why? before the film... You're you're slowed down by meeting a new character, and it it just kind of needlessly introduces a new character, and it just slows the finale um, because they yeah, just need a, to get to the ending. That's but, a weird move to be like, hey, here's this other guy. Twenty minutes before the movie ends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that, uh, yeah, it makes sense. That's too too complicated to explain at the end, and like the only thing you get from it is that you know maybe Lewis Tully was like lying or making himself more important to the Ghostbusters than he was. But like, you don't also need that for his character because like, it doesn't matter for his character either. Yeah. It it just didn't, it doesn't really add anything because just yeah. having him suit up at the end, having Lewis right. just being like, I want to take it. charge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that all went out the window, hmm. but it makes sense. Right. Eugene um, Levy's doing just fine. Yeah, yeah right? <laughs> <laughs> He's been playing that same kind of character for years. Well, and, like, Eugene Levy was probably already, like, a pretty big actor because that's the only reason why you would, like, introduce a character before a finale of a movie if it was, like, a cameo. Like, it feels yeah. like it was more, like, like... Oh, it's that guy from that thing! Oh, yeah. hey, it's that guy with the eyebrows. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Loved him in Splash. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay, next one. Uh, E.T., the extra... Terrestrial. Oh. So, after Elliot gets drunk uh, via osmosis, well, I guess E.T. gets drunk, making Elliot drunk in class. You remember this scene? Yeah, that was great. No. What? Yeah, it's like the most. What? Yeah, <laughs> it's like one of the best scenes. You of just E.T. said he gets him drunk, and I was like, "What are you actually talking about?" <laughs> we watched what? this like a couple years ago. <laughs> E.T. Yeah. finds his like the beers in the fridge. Yeah, he's just fucking around the house, and then he gets oh, the beers in the in that's the fridge. Right. And then he starts drinking, and then that's Elliot's okay. laying in class, and he's like looking at the girl, like, "Hey, yeah, <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, it's coming back to me." <laughs> um. So he gets sent to the principal's office, and one of the most famous actors at this time, and it was Wyatt's cut. I'm sorry, I'll never do him again. I see you find young people from good homes, every advantage, your whole life laid out in front of you. And I see the pot, the pills, the... Angel wings. He's definitely putting on a different kind of voice, and he's playing very against type 
he's playing a square when he's usually the the cool guy. The cool I guy. The no coolest way. guy from the eighties. Is that Harrison Ford? That is Harrison Ford. <gasps> oh. <laughs> oh my god, I love the coolest guy from the eighties, Harrison Ford. <laughs> I'm just like, I don't know. <laughs> Come on, Indiana Jones and Han Solo makes I mean, you the coolest guy in the sound, 80s. Yeah, that's not, no, no, I'm not disagreeing. I just, I'm just laughing at the, you're just like, Harrison Burke. Um, that doesn't sound like him at all. Yeah, because he's clearly like trying to be a little bit kind of square, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Ford was currently dating E.T. screenwriter Melissa Matheson, and she asked him to play against type and be the this very square principal. Um, they cut the scene because it feels kind of like a different movie because they're like hiding, they're deliberately hiding Ford's face throughout this whole yeah. shot, right. which kind of in the movie, the only, you only really see the mom as an adult, like you only see adults in certain ways in that movie. Right. Um, but this one's like too obvious. It's like, why are they hiding him so much? And he's not Dr. Claw from Inspector Gadget. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it like, it, yeah. it, it, sud- it like suddenly makes it seem like a really sinister, like weird. Like noir. Yeah. Like yeah. the tone yeah. like totally changes. Like even the lighting, the lighting of this scene is like weird. I know. Look, yeah. if I'm a, pa- you know, I am a parent, but if I go into like my son, like if he's like he called to the principal's office, I go in there and it's only being lit by like a street lamp. <laughs> at night like from yeah. the outside like what the fuck is going on here yeah. why Come is on. it so goddamn dark in here <laughs> yes very sinister right? yeah it is it's like an interrogation yeah. there's just like a, one loose like swinging light bulb in the top of the ceiling the principal's face is like shrouded and in, in darkness all you see is just the shadow from the blinds yeah did I stumble into a noir? What's happening <laughs> yeah. here? So it feels very weird. Are you, um, are you and hiring then... this principal to try and find out who <laughs> killed your father like... yeah but also at the time, you knew who the hell for Harrison Ford was, so that voice probably clicked much easier. And yeah. then, so it was just too distracting. It was too weird. So they cut it. Yeah, and again, like, why would you pay Harrison Ford to not show his face? That seems <laughs> yeah. like a, an odd move. <laughs> yeah, you know, he was doing well enough yeah. at that point. <laughs> He's like, yeah, um, you don't need to see my face. I mean, yeah. don't make up. Don't have to do that. <laughs> yeah, save, right. Save some money <laughs> there. there it obviously saved on lighting. <laughs> <laughs> we got to shoot this real cheap, guys. Yeah. <laughs> we spent all of our money on Harrison Ford. We can't afford any lights or <laughs> yeah. crew or a camera, a focus puller. <laughs> His whole thing's just out of focus. <laughs> uh, wouldn't that be funny if that was just the reason they had to cut it? Oh, it was out of focus the whole time. Oh, oh yeah. God, that would be... <laughs> With Harrison Ford on Ooh. set? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. Oh. All right. So this is the first one. The first one. I love mm-hmm. these movies. Uh, Rick Mayall. I think it's Mayall. Uh, British comedian, probably best known to all of us as Drop Dead Fred. <laughs> um, he was cast as Who? Who would you think he, now he was not replaced, but he played a character that was, I guess, a fan favorite from the books that Mm. is not in the movie. Oh my God, I'm not going to get this. And then my Harry Potter cred will just go straight out the window, my Harry Potter fan cred. Um, Okay. So think of Drop Dead Fred, that kind of, that guy. Drop Dead Fred. Oh, Peeves, the poltergeist. Peeves, well done. Yeah. Look at oh. you go. <laughs> <laughs> hair flip, hair I can, flip. Credit. I can maintain my title. <laughs> Your title is world's number intact. one Harry Potter fan. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, he was going, he was playing Peeves mm. uh, for the first Potter film. Uh, he never read the books, but he said he did it because it was a good paying job. <laughs> sure. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Makes sure. Makes sense. Well, and like, yeah, that's a, like, Peeves is in every single one of the, like, Peeves is a, is a is recurring, he yeah, yeah, yeah like, books, he's yeah. in every book. He is always fucking shit up. In minor, <laughs> yeah, in like, in like very, like, like minor ways. Like Drop Dead Friends. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, like any of the ghosts, right? Because they had, um, what's his face is nearly John headless Cleese. Nick, John Cleese, yeah. right? So it, it would be like similar to that level of involvement, I would imagine. Hmm. They could write another book just called Harry Potter and the Fucked Up Shit and just yeah. all be about peeves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> don't, give, don't give her any ideas. She's already like way off base with these goddamn spinoffs. We don't need That's a fucking true. peeves spinoff. <laughs> God damn it. It's just fan- the next one, just Fantastic Beasts. Peeves. Fan- <laughs> Fantastic Peeves and where to find him. No! Uh, JK! Uh, peeves Watch. 
Although you could you could probably do a you could do a, as we keep referencing a Rosencrantz and Guildenstern with Peeves, and uh-huh. then just do a movie where he's just like he's just like the reason weird shit happens throughout yeah. the movie. Yeah, <laughs> he's talking to, he's talking to Tom Riddle and be like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. Let's yeah. let's curse some motherfuckers. <laughs> no, he's, he's like yeah, taking... he's the one that was like, have you heard about this spell, Tom Riddle? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is how you preserve your soul. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's him. It's been him all along. <laughs> it was Peeves all along. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a new t-shirt it was peeves all along um, according to him he may have ad-libbed a little too much on set mm. he was like a little too crazy and he made the kids just constantly laugh and uh, you know they were kids right, right. Um, they weren't really trained actors at all at, at this point right um, he filmed for three weeks then they told him they were cutting him entirely from the film Oh, like before he was even done yes. filming. They're just like, this is not working out. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yes. So this kind of skirts the line a little bit, but it's kind of like they clearly were just like, we don't have time to put Peeves in here now. Like, Yeah. Like this movie is big enough without this. Yeah. Right. This nonsense. Uh, he didn't tell his kids that he was cut from it. Oh. So when they saw it, <laughs> they thought he was Hagrid. <laughs> Oh my God! That's and he's just like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I am. Yeah. Yep. Um, he that's said he was fine being funny. cut because he thought it was a crap film. Oh, of course, yeah. Listen, drop dead, Fred. You can calm the fuck down. I'm Team Sanity, by the way. Yeah, oh, um, that's a, that's a deep podcast cut. Yeah. Um, the so that's just uh, that's just one of those things where I'm like, if if he. If he did well, that he would have been set up for like eight more movies. Every single, yes. At the very least, that he'd be like floating through the halls, like screaming like a madman, and be like, "Well, right. there's peace." Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> this is like the thing about adapting books. It's you know, and like there's this this constant argument where fans are just like, "It wasn't as good as the book because it didn't have this, it didn't have that, it didn't." Have that. And it's like if you tried to put all the shit that was in a book in a movie, like it would be the worst movie. Yes. Like you can't. It's a completely different medium. Yeah. Peeves doesn't really make make sense. Is he kind of like the Tom Bombadil? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Lord of the Rings is like very famous for its very concise, exquisite usage of characters. Yeah. Like, yeah. like okay. um, uh, exquisite. Arwen is not the the elf that picks up. Um, Frodo after right. he gets stabbed and taken to Rivendell. It's another character entirely. But they're like, well, Arwen is a character that's important to the rest of the story. Why don't we just use her? Because that other elf doesn't factor into anything else. Like, that's smart adaptation. Right, exactly. Yeah. So you could have done that through all of Harry Potter if they had just made made the films after she was done with the books. Yep. Okay, let's move on. This is a really random one. Um, <laughs> the Rules of Attraction. Have you seen this movie? I don't think I have. Uh, James Vanderbeek. Um... Uh, no, I have not seen. This movie. <laughs> <laughs> you lost me at James Vanderbeek. Um, it's a it's a weird college movie. You've seen it. We've watched I'm it. I'm sure. Um, I what's have. her name from Night's Tale? Shannon Sossaman or Shannon uh, Sossaman. Sossaman. Ian Somerhalder. Uh, random people in it. Anyway, the film is an adaptation of the novel written by Brett Easton Ellis. Okay. whose multiple novels have reoccurring characters. Rules of Attraction has James Vanderbeek playing Sean Bateman, the younger brother of... Patrick Bateman. Patrick Bateman. Mm. What? What? Yeah. So... this Is this a cinematic universe? So his books, his books <laughs> the are... The Ellis Cinematic Universe? His books, right. like he has these like random characters that just appear random here and there. And this movie was kind of like, oh, Brett, uh, American Psycho was his big thing. Right. Like, let's make his next one, right? And so this is only two years after American Psycho came out. Um, Sean Bateman is at in college at the grace of Patrick's money. So okay. throughout the movie, he's he's kind of a deadbeat. He barely ever shows up for class. He's he's a drug dealer. Like, mm. it's all this kind of, it's just... Mo- like the opposite of his brother, basically. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but it, it kind of explains why he's even able to stay in school. Right. <laughs> um, right. That, so they asked Christian Bale if he wanted to do a cameo as okay. his brother. But he said he would only return if the director was the same director as American Psycho, Mary Heron. Um, 
but it was not. Roger Avery directed Rules of Attraction, so he said no. Um, then they asked Brett Easton Ellis if he wanted to play Bateman himself, which is kind of a fun little, little joke. Little Easter egg. Yeah. Um, and he was like, no, I'm not an actor. I don't want to do no, this. Yeah. Um, so they eventually cast Casper Van Dien <laughs> from Ooh. Starship Troopers Ooh. and Sleepy Hollow. Okay. Why are you hammering on me? Because he would. He, Dad, is a fucking vegetable. Watch that. Do watch that. I'm in charge of you right now, Sean. Until Dad recovers, if he recovers. Don't cross me. I yeah. think this is very funny because I think Casper Van Dien is a hilariously terrible and awesome choice. First, terrible because he's a terrible actor. Right. <laughs> yeah. He has really never been a good actor. I mean, I was... Yeah. 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 You can tell from that scene. Right. You've, if you've seen Starship Troopers, he's terrible. He's the main character. Um, and I, But he's an awesome choice because he looks like a person that would be an actual American psycho. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's true. But, like, there's he does not have the intensity of Christian Bale in yes. that role. Yeah. Like, it's either Christian Bale or you fucking, like, cut it out of the movie. Exactly. Hello. So... There was a second scene included, other than that one, um, where Sean is calling him again, and we see Patrick in a thong holding a severed head. Now, <laughs> this is cut because it's so out of place, and without Christian Bale playing that part, the connection doesn't make any sense. Right. Like, yeah. who the fuck is this guy? Yeah. Like, it's just his douchey brother, right. right? Like, how would you ever put that together that that was supposed to be the exact same character that Christian Bale made very, very famous? famous? Yeah. Right? Unless you've seen American Psycho and you know who Christian Bale is and you, like, put yeah. two and two together. Yeah. yeah. And it's not like like if it was Indiana Jones, the, the, the outfit would go, oh, I know who it is. Yeah. Right. But American Psycho, he's... In a suit. Is in a suit. suit. Yeah. <laughs> so right. doing a key bump of coke, like yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. which is every business person in the eighties. <laughs> I just need to talk for a second about what's happening with this Facebook situation. The account is called "The Movies That Made Us Gay." Like, what is going on here? <laughs> oh, oh, um, it's a very sexual movie, and Ian Somerhalder has a huge. He's he's he plays a gay character, and he's super into James Vanderbeek. He has exquisite focus. He has for exquisite James focus Vanderbeek. for him, and uh, that's funny you say that because this image that came up on IMDb right now was a picture of Ian Somerhalder on the phone on a bed looking straight at James Vanderbeek with just exquisite exquisite focus. focus. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and his so, T-shirt says masturbation is not a crime. <laughs> yeah. So that the movie's so just like... So we know like, what he's about immediately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, it makes sense that it's... Uh, it's exquisite focus. I, it makes sense to me. Remember, If you've seen the movie, you would get why it would be... Uh, I see, I see, I see. <laughs> I, I see this uh, Casper Van Dien, and I think to myself, I could have been an actor. <laughs> I could have done that. I could have been a bad actor who got cut out of movies. <laughs> yeah. God damn it. No. Yeah. So every once in a while you just run across actors and you're like, fucking hell. How the hell did he get a starring role? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you're like, oh, man, motherfucker. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if only if I had exquisite focus to be an actor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, if you haven't seen the movie, it's very fascinating. It's uh, it's pretty cool. There is one shot. There's there's a scene in there where it's split screen, and the two it's K James Vanderbink and uh, Shannon Sossaman going to class together, and it's two different shots coming from two different angles, and it merges into one. It's a fabulously awesome scene. And you uh, said it's a very ooh. sexual movie. Yeah, it's right, okay, don't I'll, watch I'll, it with your kids. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll go and check that out. <laughs> <laughs> with exquisite with focus. exquisite <laughs> the most exquisite focus put on your masturbation is not a crime t-shirt yep. go watch some rules of traction well, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get real Patrick Bateman and put the whole raincoat on and everything <laughs> listen to Huey Lewis in the news you like Huey Lewis in the news um okay next one um the amazing Spider-Man 2 okay uh, Clint, have you seen Amazing Spider-Man 2 yes okay what is the biggest problem with Spider-Man 3 with Tobey Maguire uh, too many villains. What, and what is the biggest problem with Amazing Spider-Man 2? Too many villains. <laughs> yeah. 
or just too many characters. Yes. Too many damn characters. Oh, this yeah. is the Andrew Garfield. Andrew second, Garfield one. Second one. Yes, the, okay. second, this, uh, the second one. I'll eventually cover all the things that went down in that film when I make a Venom video, mm -hmm. but basically Sony, Sony was super eager to build out a film universe to catch up to the MCU. They overstuffed the film, then they had to cut it down so drastically that the film is just disjointed mess. Mm -hmm. um, one of the smaller stories they cut in the film was um, who's... Emotional climax of the movie is Gwen Stacy uh, dying, <laughs> like in the right. climax, right? So, the, one of the things they cut is the introduction of Mary Jane Watson. Oh, right, right, right. Uh, played by Shailene Woodley. That's right. I remember oh, okay. that. Which actually I think is great casting for her. Uh, Woodley filmed four scenes as Peter's next door neighbor. Now, Director Mark Webb admitted that while it made sense in the scripting stage, once they got to editing, it completely ruined the stakes for Gwen. And if you can think about that, that makes total sense. Like why, mm -hmm. like right, for like her to die. Kind of introducing this other love interest, it like lessens the impact of yeah. the death of the love interest. Yeah. So you're, you, yeah. yeah you it's like, don't worry about Gwen's death. Yeah. There's another gal. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. You're going, who gives a shit about if she, Gwen's going to die? Who cares? Mary Jane's Wa Mary Jane Watson is who he's supposed to end up with anyway. So right. who gives a shit? Mm -hmm. But, but like that works really well on the whole like multiverse, no way home, multiple Spider-Mans because it's like, oh, in that Andrew Garfield universe, like Gwen Stacy was his great yeah. love yeah. and he lost her and like, and then these other Spider-Mans, like, MJ was, you know, yeah, the, the, the exactly. great love. And so yeah. it actually is like, that worked out really well for them, I guess, is what I'm saying. <laughs> mm -hmm. but they, yeah. you know. What we're all saying is No Way Home is great. Yeah. <laughs> also, like, Shailene Woodley's doing fine, so. Yes. But, that, I mean, that was a pretty, pretty big star for a pretty big movie to be uh, completely cut. <laughs> right, <laughs> like, right, right, right. Um, she said she was kind of sad about it, but, like, she loved the script. So whatever that movie would initially look like, it did not come out the way yeah. Anybody cool. wanted it. Now, just a quick fire here towards the end. The Muppets from 2011. Uh, here are all the people that were cut. Rob Corddry, Billy Crystal, Ricky Gervais, Kathy Griffin, uh, Sarah Hyland, uh, Wanda Sykes, and Danny Trejo. Damn. Now, most of them all actually show up in the follow-up, Muppets Most Wanted, yeah. which has one of my favorite lines of all time when in the prison when Tina Fey, the guards, she goes, she's going turning off all the lights and she says, Good night, prison king. Good night, skull crusher. Good night, Danny Trejo. Because <laughs> he's just there. <laughs> That's just, right. He's in the gulag. He's in the gulag. That's right. It's just, just the idea of Danny, <laughs> Danny Trejo, Trejo being in a Russian gulag. And he, oh, my God. So funny. And he requires no nickname. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Danny Trejo in and of itself is terrifying. You Which wonder is really, if that was ad-libbed. Yeah. <laughs> it's really funny because it's also um, he's in the trailers for the, the, the Muppets um, when it was coming out because they were like uh, – you can't hold us in this. He's in a cell there with the Muppets, and they're like, "We're Muppets. We have to go on. We have to be released. We have to get out to get to the, the show." Right, and then it cuts over to Danny Trejo, and he's like, "Yeah, I'm a Muppet." <laughs> <laughs> and it's also a really good Danny Trejo joke because yeah. he kind of looks like a Muppet. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why is that Muppet made out of leather? <laughs> <laughs> um, Anchorman Legend of Ron Burgundy. There are so many deleted scenes from this film that writer-director Adam McKay made an entire other film out of them called uh, Wake Up, Ron Burgundy. It, it was straight to DVD. It includes scenes from with Maya Rudolph, Amy Poehler, and Justin Long. Mm. He made a whole ass other movie out of the <laughs> Whether or not scenes. it makes any goddamn sense is another question. Yeah. I haven't seen it. Oh, okay. <laughs> he did not have exquisite focus. Exquisite yeah. focus. Uh, this that was is, the opposite. <laughs> this is Final Tap also. If you, if you have the DVD, you watch the deleted scenes it's they just have a deleted scenes and it's just as long as the original the really? whole movie Jeez. and it's just full of more shit it's dude funny. I would watch another hour of this is Spinal Tap <laughs> yeah. that sounds amazing yeah, yeah, yeah sounds really pretty good, good. <laughs> Uh, it makes sense, though, when you have a movie like that that's a comedic <laughs> movie that has a lot of really talented comedians and improvisers. And if you if it's kind of loose where you're just like, yeah, just like uh, try something out like like you're yeah. going to end up with a lot of stuff getting cut. Yes. You know? Yeah. Yes. Um, OK. And then lastly, for this quick one, Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines. Now, why does the Terminator, the T-800, look and sound like Arnold Schwarzenegger? <laughs> Digitally faced like why did why did the robot look like that person 
Because you know, why was, did they model it? Right? Well, because probably oh. he was in the movie and he got cut out. Oh, did they see like? Did the robots find like some archived footage of a Mr. Universe like competition? Here is a deleted scene of a famous actor playing who turns out to be the model. Hi, I'm Chief Master Sergeant William Candy. I was honored to be selected by CRS in the ongoing effort to save American lives. I don't know about that accent. We can fix it. <laughs> no, no. Okay, hold, <laughs> hold on. That's a whole. Just... That's a whole can of worms that just you just opened up there. Can I? Is he? Wait. Was he being dubbed over? <laughs> yes. The internet is convinced. Because he is, he is incapable as far as I'm, yes. of not having his real accent, as far as I'm aware. Right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, he is dubbed. Just so we're all on the same page. Uh, no, I was going to say, if that was really him and that's his voice, like, why, why is he, is he not... doing this all the time? <laughs> that's what I was just going to say. It's like, if you were, I mean, first of all, that accent, it's terrible. And it, and it make, it's like, that's madness. But like, yeah, if you can, if he can do different accents, like do a different accent. That's why I'm like. <laughs> that's why I fucking like jingle all the way it j- you just everyone has to just accept that Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> sounds Austrian because he can't do anything yeah, else yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, that was inter- absurd <laughs> We can fix it. Like, and that was like, was that, that a was de- Arnold? That was a de-aged. Was that a de-aged? No, that's, that actor. I've seen him in other things. So, but no. so, so somebody dubbed Arnold in like a really bad, like weird the, foghorn the internet, thing. The internet is convinced. Nobody knows who did it. Nobody that it's unlisted. Nobody knows. Uh, but the internet is convinced that is the voice of Samuel L. Jackson. No. <laughs> it did sound like a black guy. Yeah, it I was. Kind of, I was, well, and that's why I was like, okay, whoa, like. <laughs> Is this racist? And then I'm like, wait, but he's dubbed. I'm I'm just so confused. I thought it was like, did they get like Carl Weathers to like you know, his old <laughs> his old predator pal yeah, that to come in? Pretty good. <laughs> this is this is gonna be my next podcast project. This is gonna be my dead eyes. Find I am gonna try to find the actor who dubbed that shitty deleted scene from T3, Terminator 3 or whatever the hell. I, That's I mean, like so meta because he's being dubbed but then he dubbed somebody else <laughs> yeah, right. and it's like a commentary on accents that's wild that movie was already a piece of shit <laughs> so to take this out I couldn't even imagine <laughs> it's it's funny they, someone someone in the production said that it was meant to be a DVD extra but you know, who goes that far to film something like that to yeah. be an extra yeah. but um, but it's, it's very funny because it's like it's a question that people might have had. Like, did they find a guy that looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger, right, in the future? And they were like, oh, let's model our, our Terminator after him. The, the the machines were like, let's use his face for whatever reason, right? And so, so you know, fans probably had that question. And then this movie was like, let's answer that question. But then you go, oh, that question didn't need to be answered. I, I <laughs> no. don't. Not in that fans, way. Not fans did not way. have that question. <laughs> I am. A, I, I love Terminator and Terminator Two. I did not have that question. Yeah, you've My, never seen that before. No, okay. I've never seen that before. My, like Skynet doesn't give a shit what it looks like. Arnold Schwarzenegger was a Terminator, so somewhere in their database of Terminator f- looks, they had an Arnold Schwarzenegger model, and they were probably just like, "Yep, sure, that's print. the one." Yeah, like you don't 3D need print. To, you don't need to explain it. It makes sense. <laughs> It so, makes sense. My whole working theory is that <laughs> Skynet just built robotic skeletons and like, hey, you know what? In order for us to get these skeletons back in time, they need to be covered by uh, an organic you know, material. So let's just put some flesh on top of this robot. And that sculpt, that, 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 this, the skull robot head just happened to be <laughs> what Arnold Schwarzenegger looks like. And so that's why he looks the way he does. That was always my working theory. Yeah. I never had to come see, from some. See, you had a theory though. You had a theory. You had the question. Yeah, but like I only came up with that right now. Like, I, I did not... <laughs> All right, so I'm a little cheating on that one, but I, I think that's fascinating. That is really funny. Uh, last one, and this is kind of a meta thing. At the time when I wrote this, it was like perfect. Uh, the ring. 2002. Oh, yeah, because I did that guest spot on Sequoia's podcast, but make it lovely. 
So in the film, Naomi Watts plays journalist Rachel, and the uh, the original intro of her character was her interviewing a serial rapist murderer, Ooh. played by Chris Cooper um, from American Beauty uh, adaptation. Big guy, won an Oscar, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the guy is in prison, and he's trying to get her to write about how he has found God and is a reformed man. Right. And she's not buying it. No, she's I, like, nope, nope. <laughs> like, fuck you, you're, you're staying here. Um, rest of the movie happens, <laughs> all of it. At the very end, she gives Cooper a copy of the tape <laughs> as kind of oh. like, a, like a super oh. dick move. <laughs> Damn. Right? She's like, I'm judge, jury, and executioner. <laughs> You're welcome. Whoa. Getting these rapists off the street. That is very like convoluted though and sort of feels unnecessary to the movie. Yeah, yeah I know. But where should, is they have VHS there? <laughs> like right. does he have a there's no T V <laughs> prisoners aren't gonna have their own VHS and like so he's gonna be watching that with like in a common area yeah. with like nine, knows. ten other other prisoners. She just like, like signed the death sentence of like everybody in that jail. Yeah, they're gonna be like, "Hey, Cooper, what's hey, Cooper? What's this video? I don't know. Some journalist sent it to me." And then all of a sudden, they're like, "Hey, Johnson, you got a phone call? Well, that's weird. I don't have anyone. That, I've, I've been here in seven years and never got a phone call. Seven days. What the fuck is this shit? You know? They're like, "Hey, no, Stevenson, no. you got a phone call? No, no, like, no phone it's, call it after goes, phone call. It goes, it goes seven days. Now I have the phone to Stevenson. Yeah. <laughs> seven days. Okay, now I have the phone to Johnson. Yeah. Seven days." Um, uh, according to Cooper, they cut it because the test screenings thought he'd figure more into the po- plot, <laughs> which he doesn't at all. And as far as I know, right. none of this footage actually exists. You can't okay. find it. Uh, but yes, I, I put that on there so you can do a plug. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. It's this. Well, this is months ago now. I know. Um, but for Valentine's Day, I did a yeah, I guess spot on um, the podcast, but make it scary. But we did a But Make It Lovely, where we took a horror movie, um, The Ring, and turned it into a rom-com. And it's uh, it's it's pretty fucking funny. So go check it out. Um, that's the last one. But I do have two things when you, what we want, I want to do before we wrap up here. I want to go over the fact that the Oscars just happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and we mm-hmm. are a show about movies. Um, and I kind of stopped watching them. I don't really care anymore. But I'm going to go through this real quick, what I want to talk about, because it's an update to some of the other shit we've we've talked about. Okay. I'm going to avoid the Will Smith shit, but everyone giving him a standing ovation was fucked. Anyway, <laughs> um, there were all pro- there were really weird things, problems with this show that had nothing to do with Will Smith. Like the in memoriam that was like trying to be like a celebration. So they had like a choir out front and they were like singing and dancing and it was like really distracting and weird. weird. Uh, they did a 60-year tribute to James Bond, remember? Film royalty, right? We were right. talking about. Right. Uh, introduced, of all the people that uh, were in the Bond franchise that are still around, including four living Bonds, uh, the, the the tribute was introduced by pro surfer Kelly Slater, pro snowboarder Sean White, and Tony Hawk. What? Why? Exactly. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of glad I didn't watch the Oscars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, they, the Oscars sounded like a bit of a shit show. Yes, to be that, that's why I'm kind of going to uh, yeah. animated. The animated feature category was introduced as films for kids. Like the presenters were like, you know, these films because your kids are just watching them all the time and you're getting sick of them. And it's like. No, these are legit. These are still films. Dude, way like, to like just shit all over the careers of like hundreds of people. Yes. Oh, your little An cartoons. entire industry. Your little cartoons don't matter. They're just bullshit shows for kids. Yeah, exactly. But here's the point. Uh, the Academy Awards are about the industry celebrating and giving out awards for itself. This is, it's them. It's, I saw, I saw a, a great Twitter post. Jerk, basically. Exactly. It's, it's <laughs> psychopaths giving awards to other psychopaths. <laughs> um, Narciss- well, narcissists. Yes. Yeah. It was just a joke, but yes, right. like they're all narcissists just trying to show up so they can be like, oh, I'm so great. I thank you. Um, and so it's not the people's choice awards. Uh, yet because of declining viewership, the Oscars have been trying to make, like make changes to get more people to watch it. I guess. Saying Tony Hawk will be a presenter with Sean White will get people to watch it, whatever. 
So one of the the changes was to make the show shorter by not televising eight categories. And this was a huge thing that people got real pissed about. Uh, Film editing, production design, sound, makeup and hairstyling, original score, and the three short film awards were not televised. Now, people flipped out over this. I actually don't think this is a big deal because the Oscars gives out 24 awards. The Grammys gives out 86 and they televised like 10 of them. Mm. And the and the Grammys just turned it into a celebration. And we have so many awards where there's no way we're going to be able to just sit there and show everybody this because yeah. you just bored as hell. So cutting down the Oscars makes sense to me. Note that this this change did not make the Oscars shorter. It was still over three hours. Um, now, the reason I'm bringing this up, there were two new segments were added. Most cheerworthy moment in cinema... And fan favorite film of the year. Oh, I'm, I heard about these. So I heard about most this. cheer worthy moment. Oh shit! Was I know in, where this is going. In history, in all of cinema history. So think of "Get Away from Her, You Bitch" from Aliens, yeah. or like everything in Lord of the Rings. Or, I am your father. <laughs> yeah, just well, I mean, that's well, not, that's that's not cheer worthy, but, but like the Death cheer- Star blowing up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a cheer worthy moment because it's like, <gasps> yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. All those, everything that you can possibly think of. The T Rex saving, um, eating the raptor before they get eaten in Jurassic Park. Whatever it is. Yeah. All these things. Here are the top five. Bullet time from the Matrix. I would not call that a, a cheer worthy moment. That's, that's, Just that's, cool. the, that's like a whoa. Yeah. That's a that's ooh, that's uh, a whoa. I'm <laughs> I'm going. To, I I am telling you. I'm not going. Uh, a song in Dreamgirls, Avengers Assemble. From Endgame. K. Yes. Yes. Sure, yeah. Yes. But I would argue that cat lifting, you know, when was bigger, cheer worthy. Oh, yeah. When you're in the yeah. theater, that's the moment where people fucking freak the fuck out. Or, or are brought to tears like myself. <laughs> yeah. I just cry at <laughs> everything. everything. <laughs> I cry at everything. Um, and this was kind of just because it was recent in people's mind, but the three Spider-Men team, teaming up yes. in No Way Home Excellent. when they all land on the Empire State Building together. Yeah. like. It's, yeah, great moment. I don't know if it'll rank up there with going forward in history, but it was new, whatever. Well, why did they, like, why did they categorize it of, like, of all time? What if, it, like, why not just be, like, of the year? Of the last year. I don't know. That makes so much more sense. Because the number one cheer movie, according to Twitter, so this is all based off of Twitter, was The Flash entering the Speed Force and Zack Snyder's Justice League. Fuck. No, that's Fuck literally that. the worst moment of all of all time of ever of any movie okay. that's ever. No, no, no. Happened. You, you, it's not a scene you've watched. It's not the part where oh, he it's saves not the hot the dogs car. part. No, not the hot dogs part. Oh, okay, no, no, well no. that part's it's, bullshit. No, so. it's the end of the movie where he reverses time by going so fast. Okay, it's sure. Okay, super, <laughs> it's it's listen. Fine. Superman, it's not a terrible Superman moment. Did it, okay? It's not like terrible moment by any means, but it is. As a rule, it's not great in it, but uh, it's. Silly, and it is definitely not better than anything we've mentioned so far. Yeah. And that's because these fucking Snyder cultists mm-hmm. are just know how to use Twitter and just hashtag the shit out of yeah. what they want. Mm-mm, uh, mm-mm. And to point out that Zack Snyder's Justice League, it was never put in theaters. <laughs> <laughs> so mm. should it even fucking qualify? Mm. Mm. <laughs> Look, this a, is not a visual a podcast, but I've been shaking my head no for the yeah. last four minutes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Second fan favorite film of the year. So of 2021. Right. Okay. This is, now remember, this is post, this was meant to be kind of like, okay, we don't nominate the big, huge blockbusters because the the best picture is supposed to be about the big artsy ones, you know, the low budget, Power of the Dog, Coda, all those ones, right? Um, so this is kind of like a way to be like, oh look, let the like the the re- the regular people vote for what they want to be in the movie yeah. or to be their favorite movie. So in the year of two thousand twenty one, when we had stuff for fans, regular people, right? We had No Time to Die, Shang-Chi, mm-hmm. yep. Ghostbusters Afterlife, right. Free Guy, sure. Dune, yeah. The Suicide Squad, I'm in. in the Heights, yep. big uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda fans, The Green Knight even uh, was sure. mm-hmm. this big weird one. Pig was this people really loved. loved it was like Pig, yeah. from with Nicolas Cage. Yeah. And they're even big defenders of Matrix Resurrections. We won't go into that. But here are the top five for... Uh, fan favorite, according to Twitter. Number five, Tick, Tick, Boom. 
It was good. Yeah, Ticket Boom was good. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Number four, Spider Man No Way Home. Okay. Number four. Number four. four. Okay. <laughs> that feels like bullshit. Number three, Minamata. What? What? What is that? Exactly. What? Uh, uh, I am stars Johnny Depp. We will eventually get into Fantastic Beasts and Johnny Depp issues, mm -hmm. but Johnny Depp has just as much of a following almost as Zack Snyder. Really? Via Twitter. People will defend him to the death. And even though this movie never really released anywhere else, <laughs> like never really came out to any theaters, his fans just voted the shit out of it. Oh my God. Johnny Depp fans coming out on the Twitters? Yes. Damn. Number two, Cinderella. The what? Amazon one? Yes. Again, who the fuck is talking about Cinderella? Are we do 10-year-olds use Twitter? <laughs> What's right? happening? And number one, the number one fan favorite film of the year, Zack Snyder's Army of the Dead. Uh it was fun. <laughs> I I enjoyed it. Was it better than anything that I just said? No yeah. time to die, Shang Chi, no, no. like Ghostbusters, no. like Dune, Suicide no. Squad, Spider Man No Way Home. No. Nope. Like what the fuck? So okay, okay, okay. So, I would, I would so rank that was... at the bottom of all of those. <laughs> yeah, but it was. I mean, it was, I'm not trying to defend. It. I'm not defending it at all because fuck that, <laughs> fuck all of that. It was, it was fun. <laughs> okay, but okay. So this, these movies were not like pre-chosen as like select your favorite. It was just sort of like, hey, everybody, blast Twitter with your favorite movie, your and hashtag. then like we'll like take an informal, like we'll pull some data and do like a Twitter Twitter. Po yes, Twitter polls are bullshit. It's it just it hashtagged it, hash those the these fucking Snyder kids. Yeah, those They're like just, Snyder bots and Snyder no. bots. A lot of them bots. Like yeah. it's just they just fucking attacked it. And I, if you went to any of those kids' houses, Army of the Dead was your favorite film of the year. None of them would ever say that. No. Over anything I all these other movies, it's just because it's fucking him. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> Zack Snyder bought like a bunch of like uh. Bot accounts in the Philippines. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, hashtag Army of the Dead. Hashtag Army of the Dead. <laughs> just, it's just like I, I, I joked on Twitter with the, our, the the account was like, well, this is the the first and last time they ever do this. Oh yeah. No, yeah, that's that, that, ill advised. That bit him in the ass. Yeah. Ill advised. Like like a zombie coming for you. <laughs> it bit him in the ass. You can you watch the the cheerworthy moment, and there's like po moments where you can like, kind of hear the crowd going yeah, and then the the flash part comes up, and everybody's like. Crickets. Wait, what? They they were all just like, "What the fuck just happened?" Wait, this they, is what because they all just all immediately realized that all those fucking toxic fans had just won that moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like over a hundred years of cinema, <laughs> they chose when the Flash, played by Ezra Miller, entered the fucking Speed Force. Grant Gustin did it better in the Flash TV series. <laughs> I would even I would even say there were better moments in that film. <laughs> yeah, in that whole movie altogether. Yeah. yeah. Um. Dude. And and uh, like, uh, I fucking clockwork. I don't know what the hell happened. So while I was preparing for this, uh, re re hashtag Restore the Snyderverse is trending on top Once of Twitter again. today. Wrapping up our. Re uh, hashtag release the Snyder Cut <laughs> awfulness. The saga that I, will not die. Yeah, and, and, and the fact that there are like, uh, one of them I like went after uh, on Twitter today was like, who? what other director won two Oscars for two different films in the same ceremony? <laughs> okay, first of all, not real awards. <laughs> that You get like a badge. Maybe they'll send you a fucking certificate. Yeah. You don't get one a those, statue. Like, YouTube plaques. <laughs> yeah. 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 The, so, the blimp from the Teen Choice Awards, yeah. <laughs> but they just scratched out teen and put like... People, like fan choice. <laughs> Here you oh, go. We had some Fuck extra you. Teen Choice awards yeah. laying around. They just put like some gold spray paint on it. No, it it's not a real award. Nobody was given it. Zack Snyder's not there to get it. Like it doesn't fucking matter. And secondly, ha that the, they they keep saying that like how many other directors won for two different films? And so I easily many. pointed out in '93, Spielberg released Jurassic Park. And Schindler's List. Jurassic Park won three different Oscars, and Schindler's List won seven. That was off the top of my fucking head. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah. There are probably way more. That's just, yeah, it's just... Absolutely absurd. These dumb 
yeah, these dumb motherfuckers who basically are just like, I don't know movies before Zack Snyder started yeah. directing. Like, what? There were movies before then. Of all the things to <laughs> latch on to, why this? I don't there, fucking get it. I don't either. Like, I'm sitting over here just like fuming, <laughs> trying to calculate these these scenarios in my brain of like, why why this? Why this? Why die on this hill? Yeah. It's not good. It doesn't yeah. make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Okay. <laughs> Move it. Last thing. Shout outs. Uh, I've been avoiding kind of YouTube people and I should say stuff. Five easy fixes is our top comment commenter on YouTube. Woo! They, they are, were one of our first subscribers uh, on nice. the Iron Man video. And I guess they got to the point where they were like, oh, check out these podcasts. <laughs> and has been enjoying them. Yay. Um, and then, but smash that uh, subscribe button. Mm-hmm. Shout outs to Kiara, Eve, James, Mel, Dallin, Davis, Daryl, Marcelo, Icy, Insane Ian, My Tea Time, Lord VW, 1995 Yuda, Crazy Rabbits, and of course, Anti Toast the Second. Of course. <laughs> Well done. These are some excellent <laughs> internet's names. Thank you, guys. Thank you for listening. We appreciate it. We really do. Please uh, go on Twitter and get us one of those People's Choice Awards. <laughs> yeah. For best uh, cheerworthy podcast right. of 2021. <laughs> Anti Snyder or right. hashtag Barthwatch 2022. 2022. <laughs> um, and okay, actually, <laughs> finally, my dear fans, uh, expect a much slower rollout of episodes than, <laughs> than usual. Um, my work had a big shakeup, and this summer I'm basically being uh, doing two people's jobs, and I'll have very little time to work on shit show. So this is going to slow down to a crawl for a little bit here. Sorry. This is not the end. Uh, just a severe roadblock. Uh, don't unsubscribe. No, 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 no. We will have new we, episodes. Yeah, we will be back. But with that said, Clint... Do you want to research and host one of your own episodes? Fuck no. Are you kidding me? You think I, you think I can do what you do? I, I can easily give you something to punt it to you, and I can give you all this the, all the things, and it will be one of your favorite topics ever. I Okay, I, all right. I will try, but you're, we're going to see. If people are going to see a drastic. <laughs> if we're expecting our fans and our viewers and listeners to expect a drastic decrease in rollout of episodes, we can expect a decrease in drastic slowdown of subscribers if you have me do this. Unless we're going to be talking about we're Godzilla. All about, we're all about or, quantity or quality versus quality. Yeah, so we would definitely want to go with quant- quality. We do not care about quantity. Okay, what would what would you say you're gonna say if it was about what? I mean, I w- I always talk about Godzilla or like Mortal Kombat. <laughs> I mean, those those are the things that I I, I can I could. Oh easily my god, are we do. finally gonna talk about Mortal Kombat <laughs> Annihilation? I'm so excited. I feel like you should do my I'll Mortal host, Kombat. Right? I'll host that episode. <laughs> it will fit squarely <laughs> fit squarely into your fandom. But all right, tease if it actually happens. Oh my god. I mean, let's not promise, but I mean, <laughs> if. Listen, you're the captain of this ship. Jenny Ray's the first mate. I'm scrubbing the poop deck, right? Okay, Swabby. Yeah, if you want, if you want old Swabby to, to do a, do an episode, I I am I am happy to do it. Okay. I will. I. We'll see how it goes. Let's see how this goes, friends. It's gonna be a shit show. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yay! <laughs>